Hi, lovely CAWC ladies. Welcome to Quarantine Tuesday with me, Dahlia Bifus, your host and hospitality chair. Today we have a very exciting talk. I'm very looking forward to listening to it. It's how to satisfy your wanderlust in our new world with the uh, turquoise, um, well, how, what do I call you? Turquoise. Turquoise um, holidays. <laughs> turquoise holidays uh, with Sue Bell. And she's going to uh, tell us all exciting things that we can look forward to um, once we are uh, getting more out of our current situation that we're in. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Sue. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, um, Andrea, for inviting me today. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about turquoise. Um, we specialize in long haul travel to islands and beaches around the world. Um, we're just small family owned by myself, my husband James and our good friend Brian. Um, we've all worked together in the travel industry for many years, um, but we started Turquoise in 2002. We're actually based in the Old Town, um, so I'm sure you've been up to Brasserie Blanc. So if you ever um, drive to Brasserie Blanc and, and go along the little cobbled alleyway out to the car park at the back, we're literally just opposite in an old stables. Um, we, we work together, the three of us work together for many years in Camden Town um, for a previous travel company before we decided to start Turquoise in 2002. I guess my wanderlust started way back in my childhood when um, my father was in the Air Force and we were stationed in different bases all around the world and actually our longest stint was in Malaysia on an Australian Air Force base in Butterworth. And ever since then, I always wanted to reconnect with the Aussie kids that I went to school with and grew up with. And I guess so in my 20s, I got an opportunity to just take off and go traveling through Asia and out to Australia and then eventually on to New Zealand. Um, and from New Zealand, I, I was lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time in the South Pacific. And when I came back to the UK, I wanted to stay in the travel industry. And I actually met up with James and Brian in Camden. Um, James had been many years in the ski industry and Brian had actually been traveling around Australia as well. He'd been a taxi driver in Sydney. He'd worked for trail finders, who I'm sure you're all um, aware of. Um, so we all, our kindred spirits got together and, and yeah, we started Turquoise in 2002. Our dream was to sell luxury holidays to desert islands and beaches all around the world. And Turquoise obviously seemed the right name to, to use to create our brand. Actually, James, uh, my husband, who's the marketing man, he always loved the Tiffany blue, the, the you know, the, the sort of the Tiffany look and feel. So I guess that's really where Turquoise came from. Um, originally, when we started, I wanted to, I guess, give people the opportunity to do what I'd done and get out to the Pacific Islands and namely to, to explore Tahiti and to Fiji. And really, that's how, how Turquoise started. And our initial clients, our very first clients, were honeymooners. And back in the old days, when we just had a tiny office um, where Farron Ball is now, Jane, our very first um, inquiry, I remember James went and hand-delivered the honeymoon itinerary with a red rose. Um, he spent many hours trying to source an old turquoise wax seal so that when we sent out our itineraries was that that was before social media um, so that clients could break open the wax seal and read their dream honeymoon um, that we created so i guess that's really where we started um, today now we specialize in um, the indian ocean so namely Maldives, mauritius seychelles uh, east and southern africa Obviously, South Pacific, Tahiti, Fiji, Cook Islands, Asia, Zanzibar, they're really, um, you know, where we send all of our clients. Um, we're classed in the industry as a tour operator, not a travel agent. Um, and there's a very distinct difference. We're real travel industry snobs, but a tour operator, um, we source our own product. We have all of our own uh, contracts um, and relationships with all the properties that we sell. So we only work with a small number of, we try and make them privately owned properties in all of the destinations that we work with. Um, I try and personally get to know all of the owners. Um, where we can, we work with small boutique, um, again, 
um, you know, so 50 rooms or less type properties on desert islands or on coasts um, around the world. Um, so there's no middleman. Um, we're at all bonded. Um, and I know in today's challenging world, um, it's important to know that um, if you're not able to travel for whatever reason or COVID gets in the way, um, we are at all bonded. So you have all, you know, we're protected. You can get your money back if for whatever reason you're not able to travel. Obviously, these times are challenging. A lot of clients that have booked to travel with us this year are all postponing into next year. Um, but people are traveling, people are still going to the Maldives, they are going to the Seychelles, which has opened up now. So, and, and the people that are traveling are, you know, we're having amazing feedback, but, but I appreciate that at the moment, um, people are hesitant and I can understand that. Um, and our team here, we've got a small team in Beaconsfield, we've actually got um, an office in London as well on the Northcott Road in Battersea. And our team are here to talk you through the options um, and, you know, give you the reassurance that you need um, to book that dream holiday, hopefully when we do come out of, of, of lockdown. Um, just to tell you a little bit about us, um, we, as I say, we were founded in 2002. We've actually won various awards along the way, which we're very, very proud of. Um, hopefully you might all have heard of Condé Nast Traveller magazine. We were just recently voted the number one tour operator actually said number one tour operator in the world which I'm, I'm going to obviously tell you but number one tour operator um, as voted by their readers we were given that accolade last week which we're very very proud of um, and obviously hopefully that will instill confidence in in clients to to book their you know their holiday with us um, you know I guess one of the things that I've always uh, believed in and I've always been passionate about is that we we try very, very hard to ensure that all of our team, and we're just a small team, travel to all of the places that we sell. They visit all of the properties that we work with. I personally know most of the owners and the managers. If I don't, Brian and James do. Um, and so I guess we can talk you through why we're recommending a certain property, why we're sending you to a certain des destination. And we can also help you combine different islands um, and different experiences. So. A lot of our clients want to go um, on safari, for example, before they then go to their beach. So often we can handpick a safari lodge in South Africa and twin it with um, a coastal retreat in Mozambique or our favorite hotel um, in Mauritius or Kenya and the Seychelles are really good combinations, Tanzania and Zanzibar. We've traveled to all of them. I've spent a lot of time traveling. Um, I don't do so much now because I've got young children, but all of our team, there's always somebody in some far flung corner of the world. So we, you know, we, we're happy to offer our, our first hand um, advice. The new world of travel, which is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Obviously, I appreciate that things are challenging now. Um, there are lots of borders that are closed. Um, it's exciting to know that the Caribbean's opening up. Um, Travel corridors are the important, I suppose, um, buzzwords of, of today. Um, and a lot of the Caribbean islands like Antigua, St. Lucia, Barbados, um, uh, Bequay, um, yeah, some, yeah, Grenada, all of those uh, Caribbean islands are now open. Um, so is the Seychelles. So you can travel safely to those islands and come back to the UK and not have to quarantine. There are obviously various rules and regulations in place. So um, in some of the Caribbean islands, when you first arrive, you do have to um, spend four or five days in resort before you can go out exploring. Um, and then they ask you to have a COVID test after four or five days. And as long as you're negative, you can then go out um, into the wider community and explore those islands um, in, in, you know, more in depthly. The same in the Seychelles now. When you land, you have to spend the first four or five days in the hotel that we've booked for you. But once you've done that and you've tested negative and the hotels do all of that on a complimentary basis, then you can go out into, into the wider um, community and, and start exploring further. Um, our mainstay, the Maldives, Mauritius, um, the islands that we've always sold for the last 18 years, um, those borders are open, but um, Boris has not yet put the Maldives and Mauritius onto um, 
are safe travel corridors. So when you do come home from the Maldives or Mauritius, now well, Mauritius is still closed, hoping to open up soon. The Maldives, we are we do have clients traveling to the Maldives, but um, sadly, when, when you do come back from the Maldives, you do have to quarantine for 14 days. But if that's okay and you, you can do that, then it's very, very safe and easy to go to the Maldives at the moment. Um, just moving on, um, where we can travel to right now, as I mentioned, the Caribbean islands and the Seychelles are the main ones. South Africa has opened up, but yet um, not yet to, to UK travellers. The same for Thailand, um, the same for Bali, um, Kenya again. Kenya's open. We can go to Kenya, so as long as um, we've got clients out on safari at the moment, as long as you're prepared to quarantine on the way home, Kenya is fine, so is Tanzania and, and, and so is Zanzibar. Um, but hopefully things will start to open up. Um, but, but definitely you can be assured that, you know, um, booking into next year, there's no problem at all. Flights have opened. I'm well aware that uh, people are going to be more cautious about where they want to travel to. And I guess that's one of the things that we are specialist in and we're very focused on at the moment is that, um, you know, sending people out to the African wilderness, sending people to small boutique, privately owned hotels where you can have your own space in a villa. Um, they're the kind of places that people are looking for now. And they're also the kind of places that we've always worked with and, and we still specialize in now. Um, so hopefully that will give you reassurance that um, we are, you know, we are very, very COVID safe and very COVID aware um, when we're planning a holiday um, for you. Um, just a few ideas to give you a taste of, of some of the places that we, we, you know, we, we are sending people to and hopefully sending people back to. Um, unique and unusual, well, that first picture there is um, a little banda, one of six bandas on a tiny island off Zanzibar called Van Jovi. You fly into Dar es Salaam, take a tiny plane, um, and then you, you, you go out to one of the tiny archipelagos off, off Zanzibar to Fanjovi Island, which literally is, you know, one kilometre stretch long and um, half a kilometre wide um, and some of the best, best snorkelling and diving you could ever experience um, anywhere in the world. And again, it's Wi-Fi free, so if, if you feel like a digital detox, you can you can get away from all the all the pressures of today um those overwater bungalows there in bora bora which is where we started the business way back in 2002 um and um again we still have a lot of uh honeymooners still traveling out to tahiti and to bora bora and actually some of the lesser known islands off bora bora like taha like the brando um on tetituroa um you know, then the, here in the other corner, we've got uh, Zuri Zanzibar, which again is one of the best, uh, best beaches on the island of Zanzibar. Um, or New Zealand, the wilderness of New Zealand. I mean, again, where I spent five years before I, I came back to the UK, some of the mountains um, and beaches around New Zealand are, are, you know, are some of the most untouched in the world. And hopefully when New Zealand opens, it board, uh, opens its borders again, you'll be able to travel back there. Um, Safari and beach, as I mentioned before, is, is, is again one of our specialities um, for families and for clients who I guess want to, uh, you know, a bit of uh, adventure before they have their relaxation on a beach and it's a seamless combination and, and relatively easy to do. Um, and I'm, I'm very aware that people these days will probably want direct flights to most of the destinations um, that we travel to as opposed to um, having to travel indirect via a different hub. Um, so again, we're, we're very mindful of, of putting people on BA direct to the Seychelles or uh, BA down to the Maldives. So we can organize all of that for you. Um, responsible tourism is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen the launch of David Attenborough's uh, new biography, um, which is just out. I know I've watched a little bit, I haven't watched it all on Netflix. But again, a lot of the safari lodges that we work with, their focus is very much to give back to the local communities. A lot of the safari lodges, um, the funding and the money that you spend when you stay there goes back into the local communities to build schools. Um, to help with the conservation, to teach the locals um, 
about anti-poaching to ensure that we can keep all of the wildlife intact. Um, and again, um, a lot of the, the, the money that we spend and the funds that we spend um, go towards um, the conservancies outside of the Maasai Mara in Kenya and the, some of the smaller conservancies in South Africa or outside of the Sabi Sands. We send a lot of clients to the Medique, for example, on the border with Botswana. Um, and we contribute all, all of our clients that stay in any of the safari lodges there. Um, we, we put money into to those conservancies, again, to, to protect to the wildlife there. Um, with, uh, with planning ahead, thinking about what lies next, it's, it's so difficult and challenging at the moment. Um, I appreciate that people are going to be nervous, but please, if you, if you do, um, feel free to come and see us. We've got a small team still here in, in Beaconsfield. There's just five or six of us. Most of our team are working from home. In the London office, there's three or four people there, um, but we're on email, we're, we're, we're open, happy for you to come in if, if, if you feel you'd like to come and chat to somebody um, face to face. Um, I guess what lies ahead, um, who knows, um, but uh, you know, we are trying to be very careful about the decisions we make, about the, the destinations that we sell, about the partners that we work with. Um, and as I say, all of our team, very, very, uh, you know, they're all well-traveled. They, they care, you know, passionately about um, the different properties and, and, and experiences that they recommend to you. Um, and like I say, as a tour operator, um, we are protected, we, we, we are bonded, um, and we, we do hand pick all of the properties and partners that we work with. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of reassurance. I don't want to, um, to chat for too long because I'm probably, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't want to rattle on too much about turquoise, but if anybody's got any questions they'd like to ask me, if anybody um, would like me to, you know, to put in touch with any of our team to make any suggestions, um, feel free. Um, I'd love to, you know, to put some ideas together for you. We, we do, um, we are hopefully going to launch a special partnership with, with, a, with one of the islands in um, the Maldives closer to Black Friday, if Black Friday um, comes off in November. Um, so I can obviously let your members know about that and, and that's something they might be interested in if they fancy a, you know, a long haul break to or never been to the Maldives. Um, that's something we will be launching over the Black Friday weekend if, if that all goes ahead, um, COVID willing, um, later on in the year. So I do hope that's given you a little taste. The picture behind me is actually a pearl farm um, on an island called uh, Tikahau, which is um, one of the archipelagos off the main island of Tahiti. Um, that, I, that I went to many, many years ago. And it's a, it's, it's a picture that I, I've kept and, and now use in our, our branding when we, we, um, when we do little promotional talks or whatever. And, and the boy behind me, the turquoise boy, is one that James and I bought when we very first started turquoise. So they're just little bits of memorabilia. But, um, but yeah, I'm here, here in our turquoise office at the moment, looking across at um, Brasserie Blanc because people have their breakfast or their brunch. Um, but hopefully that's given a taste, given you a little taste. I don't want to talk for too long about what we offer and who we are. And um, yeah, Andrew, I don't know if there's any questions anybody would like to ask, but, um, but yeah, I'll just show you, we've, we've launched our new um, Turquoise Islands and Beaches brochure. <laughs> so you're more than welcome um, to order one or I can, I can get one um, out to you um, if, if anyone's interested. Um, and getting a taste of what we have to offer. So there you go. Just a little taste of turquoise. So if you've got a few of those, I'll take some yeah. off of you. And um, we're nice. GM in November. What, what does that mean? What they, they, I mean, what happens then is you have to continue to stay within the confines of the hotel. Um, all of the properties that we work with, all of the governments of the Caribbean, the little um, the Caribbean islands, they have specifically, um, if you like, allocated certain properties on each of the islands that are govern, uh, government approved properties that have uh, facilities, they're COVID secure, they're all um, 
quarantine guaranteed if, if you like so if you test positive you just have to stay within the confines of your hotel you can't go out into the wider community unfortunately um, that's um, and you would probably have to stay there for another five days maybe even another 14 days um, as yet actually nobody has tested positive and actually all of our clients who who who've, who traveled have been able to and actually a lot of them have just stayed and headed down to the beach and stayed within their hotels no one's tested positive yet but it just means that you're a little bit more restricted Andre you can't go out and explore the island you can't um, I guess go out to any of the local restaurants in the in the wider community that's the difference um, you have to take that risk but so far that that hasn't happened um and just on the airline i don't know if anyone's been on any planes or or, or traveled you do have to wear a mask on the flight um but and and you have to wear a mask in the public areas at a lot of the hotels but obviously if you're in a private villa or in your suite or in your rooms or you know down on the beach then 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 you don't need to as long as you you keep a safe distance from people but i i appreciate that less people are traveling now and more people are booking their holidays for travel for travel you know generally for from beyond spring next year okay thank you so much uh, sue um i just i was going to ask the same question but uh, i see that danielle has uh, has has written it here um what she says what are your favorite destinations right now uh with a flight time of under four to five hours flight time vans are four to five unfortunately we were only a long haul specialist actually james and i've always talked about doing europe um and i've actually got a, a greek and an italian program hovering in the wings which we haven't actually launched yet but the closest destinations to us at the moment um would be oman which is five hours traveling time. Um, anything under five hours, sadly, Turquoise doesn't deal with at the moment. So I'd say Oman is the closest, and then um, some of the Caribbean islands, but that they're all more 10 to 11 hours. So unfortunately, nothing less than four to five. Um, but watch this space, because I'm hoping in the new year to, to launch um, a Greek island program and an Italian program as well, which will hopefully satisfy people who, who only want to travel short haul, but, but not at the moment. Turquoise, Turquoise can't satisfy that at the moment, but, but maybe, maybe yeah, in, in a few months time, we'll have that ready to launch. Oh, that's fantastic. I know Absolutely. that uh, something like the Greek islands would definitely yeah. fit into your profile yeah. very, very nicely. And a lot of people, I think are a little bit scared to do the whole long yeah. walk you know, on a plane for that yeah. long, so that might be great. I was thinking of asking um, more of a personal question, not related yeah. to your business, but related to you, because you've traveled so extensively and you put together so many um, tra travel experiences for people, yeah. what has been your standout travel experience uh, for yourself over the years of uh, where's been your and it may be for totally sentimental or purpose um, yeah. sentimental purposes or reasons but where has your favorite travel experience been gosh um, I think probably one of the very very standout experiences was way back in the early 90s when I first came back to the UK um, it was my first taste of Africa actually and I was lucky enough to go out to Botswana and it was interesting actually I was invited on the trip to um, to go to Zimbabwe first and then head out to Botswana and I actually um, got on the plane and I was with a whole bunch of other travel industry people and I wasn't quite sure how this was going to go and, and how many people have been in the industry for how long because I was relatively new and naive and the whole um, the whole um, group that we went with were invited to go down to the back of the plane and we ended up chatting away almost in a sort of like a bar a kind of a bar atmosphere which you could never do now standing um, with the air hostesses and actually I ended up chatting to Bruce Grobelar who was a, um, a football goalkeeper for Rhodesia but then um, called Rhodesia but then Zimbabwe at the time and we ended up flying into into Zimbabwe um, and we went out into the bush on a tiny plane and, and I think for me I'll never forget because we were always we were told to take you know small bags soft luggage 
Um, and I'll never forget getting on that tiny plane with Bruce and with a bunch of other industry people flying over the bush with that, um, I guess, that sort of heart stopping moment when all the animals are running beneath you um, and just landing in the middle of nowhere. We went to a place called Boomy Hills. Um, getting there, getting out, uh, I guess, getting out of the plane, going on a game drive and getting really up close to lion and to elephant um, and just having that first touch of the wilderness. I, I think it's still, it still connects with me now. Um, from Zimbabwe, we actually drove, um, we, we drove for, for a long, long time through, through various different um, little tiny villages, eventually um, ended up in Botswana and I had my first mobile, African mobile safari experience and I was in a tent on my own and actually the first night I can remember hearing lion literally outside of my tent. We'd spent all evening drinking way too much gin and tonic around a campfire, watching the African night sky and the stars and I remember just the whole, the whole experience really, really connected with me. And then I had to get back to my tent. And of course, as you do in the middle of the night, I was desperate for the loo, but I was absolutely convinced I could hear a lion outside my tent. Um, as it turns out, there were lion going through the camp. So I couldn't leave the tent. Um, and it's one of those petrifying, heart-stopping moments. And yet I've never forgotten it. And I've been back to the African bush many, many times. And I still think the savanna, the open space, the solitude, the, uh, the silence is something that's always, always connected with me. Um, and last year, when I went back to, uh, to Africa on a safari trip, I, um, I was invited to go over to, to, to Mozambique, to southern Mozambique. And I went to a place, uh, an island called Benguera, and we stayed at a retreat called Azura. The owner of Azura is actually British and we took a little boat out to an island off Azura and sort of climbed the sand dunes and we were up at the top of the sand dunes and um, one of the teams sort of said I can see a ripple out in the water I'm sure there must be dugong well I mean I've never seen a dugong you wouldn't know what a dugong was but I was too embarrassed to ask um, and, I get, and we saw a dugong for the first time and I think there's little moments like that uh, I probably I feel lucky enough to have had those experiences and they connect with you, they're heart stopping, they're memorable, um, they stay with you. And I guess, I guess, yes, it's those moments, it's those discovering little pieces of the wilderness that, um, yeah, I, I, I guess that I want to try and enable our clients to have those same heart stopping moments. And I guess that's why whenever I travel now, I try and seek out the little bars, the little restaurants, um, the local places that people would go to that you wouldn't necessarily see in a mainstream tourist guide, if you like. Um, and they're the, they're the places that you get to know by going, the places that you get to know by um, having a relationship with the owner. Um, so yeah, I suppose in answer to your question, it's, it's the African bush, it's the wilderness. The stillness and the solitude is, 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 is I guess, something that's been very, very um, close to my heart. Um, and I go, I try and go back as many times as I can. And I want my kids to try and have that same experience when they grow up and get a little bit older. That's, that's the perfect <laughs> answer. That's fantastic. Because uh, for, for me personally, uh, hearing you speak about my home continent like that. It's, yeah, that's... so where are you from? I, I recognize. I, I'm South... originally, originally from South Africa, from Johannesburg. Yeah. Okay. And um, and uh, I've I've lived two years in Cape Town recently, okay. um, but as as an expat. But uh, I left South Africa in 1996. Uh, oh. So it, it's it, it's something being in Africa is something that really stays with you. Um, but it's so yeah. nice to hear you speak passionately about travel because. You would rather go to a person like you. I'm completely sold. I'm going to come to you and discuss my next trip when we decide to do that. But um, rather than go to a place um, uh, where there's just somebody with a computer and, and like, you know, package holidays that, okay, go here, go here. This is what the price is. To come and talk yeah. to a person like you that's actually experienced this and the reason why you're in your business and you do what you do is because you want other people to have these amazing experiences that you do. So um, that's uh, really exciting and, uh, and, 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 and beautiful that 
you can come to a person like you and, and get these tailor-made experiences from your own experience. Uh, thank you, Joe. And, and I think as well, there is a dichotomy between, uh, I guess, uh, a sort of a hypocrisy between recommending long haul travel and having to spend time on a plane, but equally, um, I suppose, giving back to the communities, giving back to the places that we work with. Um, and they do have, you know, tourism can have a positive impact. Um, as I say, and, and I do know that um, some of the lodges in East Africa that we work with, you know, they are feeling the impact now of not seeing um, any tourism. There's less funding coming in. On the other hand, um, speaking to some of the rangers that, um, that we work with very closely, you know, now the wilderness, you know, the wildlife out in, in, in the Maasai Mara and certainly in the conservancies on the edge of the Mara now, that the experience is, is, is better than it could ever be because, because sadly, no, one, no one's there. But equally, um, you know, I, I, I guess the, the environment um, is, is, is enabling to, you know, it's back to what it should be. And, and, and hopefully that, that's just a positive thing. I mean, we had, um, I had some clients out in, in, in the Mara a couple of weeks ago and they were lucky enough to, to witness a wildebeest crossing across the Mara River. And often when you get those moments, there are other vehicles that you will see on the edge of the Mara River because there are other people out there trying to get the same experience. When Simon was out there, there were no other vehicles and he was there with one other person witnessing the wildebeest. You know, he felt it was a real David Attenborough moment. And I guess there's a lot to be said for traveling now because there are no there are no people there but equally um i guess you know knowing that when you do go to these uh, smaller properties you can get certainly some of the safari lodges that we work with you can contribute um you can go and visit some of the local schools um and and see where you know what a what a positive um difference your your money is making um so that always gives me a lot of a lot of pleasure um, and it makes me you know it, it reassures me that even though we are encouraging people to travel long haul that we are enabling communities in lots of different um, private islands and, and, and coastal regions around the world we are giving back and enabling them to to again improve their lifestyle so you know it's a win-win for both of us um, so yeah I hope that reassures okay. Fantastic, thank you. And I have a question from Michelle. Um, yeah. Can you provide any statistics on COVID safety of long haul flights now? I.e., how often does flight uh, COVID infection occur? I'm not aware. Um, statistics wise, I don't have any to hand, but I'm not aware of any of the flights, certainly any airlines or flights that we've put clients on or any airlines that we work with. And we only work with the major carriers like Emirates, uh, BA, Qatar, uh, Sri Lankan, any of the airlines that we work with, all I can reassure you is so far on any of the flights or route, routes that we work with, nobody um, has contracted COVID so far. So we, we haven't had anyone affected. We haven't had anyone pick up COVID on any of the trips they've been on as yet. So I guess I can only give you my experience to date. Um, not, to be fair, not many people have traveled over lockdown and not many people are traveling at the moment, but slowly but surely as borders reopen, people are traveling. I'm speaking to clients in destination all of the time at the moment, and I can only give you the reassurance that so far, we haven't had any uh, positive, positive cases at all, and I haven't had anyone on any airlines or any feedback from any airlines that, where people have um, contracted COVID on any of the flights. So, um, so far, so good. Um, they're, they're very, very strict once you board the flights. You do have to, as I say, um, they, they do keep people spaced apart. You do have to wear masks. Um, there is some hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, I can only really go on the experiences that our clients and I've had so far and so far so good. So um, I hope that gives you reassurance, but, but no statistics to say anyone's contracted COVID yet. Well, I remember reading an article, because I'm dull, in New Scientist about flights and safety of flights 
the evidence is actually really scarce. And I just quickly Googled because I'm a member of their yeah. web. I'm sorry. Um, there's very little evidence um, <laughs> that, that proves that people can catch it more on flights. Um, and a lot of what they discuss, just looking at the prey scene, is more to do with the travelling through um, the airport, making sure that, you know, well, you're that's it, yeah. on your car to the um, terminal, spacing in the terminal, etc. Because the air on the planes is changed um, usually with it every hour and it goes through filters. Um, and, but there's been no actual active studies that they've talked about that's with regard to safety itself. They say though that it's meant to be, um, they, can't, they, can't ex they can't say that it's less safe than being in a pub and people are doing that, so. I, I saw that uh, Richard Quest on CNN did a, because uh, he does the business traveler um, segments. He did say something about uh, the way the air flows and is filtered within an aeroplane is actually quite safe, yeah. um, is what, what, what he ended up saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's quite reassure, reassuring that although, you know, I would prefer to go on a plane than a pub, I'd prefer to get COVID on a plane than a pub. But also, yeah, and also um, we are ensuring now that when our clients, wherever they're going, when they land, um, we arrange for clients to be met. We have partnerships in each of the destinations uh, where we work. So we'll always have a turquoise representative um, meeting you when you land and taking you by private vehicle or private small plane or helicopter or wherever you're going, if it's an outer island or whatever. They meet you, assist you with your luggage. And so you're not traveling, you know, you're getting off the plane. Yes, you've got to get through the, um, the airport, but then you are in a private vehicle to... Uh, the destination um, that you're going to and again in a lot of the safari lodges that we work with um, most of the safari vehicles now only have uh, a limited number of people usually maximum four a lot of the safari lodges now only take couples or single families out on game drives certainly um, in the private islands that we work with a lot of the you know the small desert islands and the retreats that we work with, they've only got a small number of rooms so you're not uh, we're not sending you to places that have large uh, volumes of crowds, if you like. So um, I think you can be reassured in that in that respect as well. But I do, I do think the airlines, um, you know, like you say, Andrew, there's no evidence to prove that you're any more likely to catch COVID. And, and, and you know, the airlines are very, very aware. So they are spacing people out. So I, I don't think... Hopefully, so far so good. There hasn't, there isn't any evidence that um, you're, you're any more likely to catch COVID. But like Andrea says, it's possibly more likely at the the airport. But then again, um, as long as you're cautious and and, and you know you, you maintain social distancing, there's no reason why you're you're more vulnerable. Having just read a little bit further whilst listening in my multitasking way, um, <laughs> most flights is replaced every three to five minutes and run through HEPA filters. Yes. Um, apparently, Rostar has been asked whether they run, the, you know, how often they replace their air, and they've really done 15 minutes, but there was no evidence proven, and they've also refused to answer whether they were HEPA filters. So I guess the, the planes seem to be quite thorough, probably more yeah. thorough than a bus or a normal train or, you know, a car with your mate. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. I mean... We're all worried, and um, um, I guess the yes. look at what what you yeah. is what's an acceptable risk. And like Dahlia said, I guess if I knew I was going to land and go to go to a little private island, you know, could sell myself happily for a fortnight. 